This has never ran better, and it has never had this much power. Not a rocket ship, by the way. But I thought this motor was dead. I thought it was actually, like, done. It has a bajillion miles on it. After my Canada trip last year, I basically limped it home. And after five, I haven't used it for, like, six months, and I love this thing. And after, like, five minutes of thinking about it the other day, and then ten minutes of troubleshooting, it has never ran better. I, I'm dumbstruck. This thing is amazing. And for those of you that have enjoyed the Rover so far, wait until you see what I have in store for it now. You are looking at version 1.0 of this Land Rover Discovery. And I could not be happier with the way that it turned out. But now that we've had it off-road, we've put maybe 10,000 miles or so on it, and we've done it in multiple states, all over different terrain types, super hot, super cold. I've been able to really whittle down a solid list of upgrades that we're gonna do to this that's just gonna take it to a completely another level. So this video marks the start of our one-ton swapped Land Rover version 2.0. Bigger tires, rear coilovers, trailing arms. We're gonna lighten up the rooftop tent setup. We're gonna build a completely new rear overlanding organizer setup. We're gonna do different goal wing windows. We have huge upgrades that we're gonna do to this. And by the end of the series, we're gonna have a brand new five-speed manual transmission. We're gonna have a brand new V8. We're gonna have an upgraded transfer case. There's gonna be a ton of work in this series and a ton of custom fab that's gonna make this even better than it is now. I'm taking my son snow camping this weekend and he wants to take the Land Rover and so do I. I mean, worst case scenario, if we don't get all this work done, we can take the Toyota, but we miss this truck and we wanna use it. But before we get to that point and before we can order rear trailing arms and all the other stuff we're gonna talk about in this video, I wanna address some of these big problems I've been having. One, the compressor on this side has been giving me a bunch of problems. So we've got it stripped apart on the table to figure out. The other compressor has been working fine, but I still wanna strip it apart, make sure that, I wanna assemble it myself and make sure that everything's ready to continue uh, a long service life. And then we have to fix the intake tube, man. I'm so embarrassed about this intake tube. We will get to this in a little bit, but this is what caused me so many problems in uh, with after my Canada trip. <laughs> well, we're gonna deal with that in a minute. I, I don't even wanna talk about it right now. So the compressor, clearly it's pulling in a ton of dirt and that is not good. We can fix that. I think that once I pulled it apart and I started looking at it, it the intake is here. So instead of using this intake cap, we're gonna leave that off and I'm gonna tap this so that we can remote mount an, in, uh, an air filter inside of our air box. And then that should help reduce, I mean, it's just so dirty in there. I mean, it, for how little these have been used, it's so inexcusable. And then what's also inexcusable is how poorly this was assembled. I mean, this, this O-ring's hanging out because somebody half-assed it whenever they're at work one day. That, there's no excuse for it. Plus, these reeds are getting really soft. They're, they should be resting closed, but they are open a little bit. So we're going to upgrade the reeds. We're going to clean everything up. We're going to tap this to remote mount an intake tube somewhere. And what I'm thinking is that I want to put it in this air box that we built last summer. Maybe pop a hole there, pop a hole there, and put an air filter. We'll see. The first thing I want to do is kind of obvious. I want to get this clean, and then I'm going to do a loose assembly, meaning that I'm gonna partially put it back together and run the motor to see what exactly is getting it to pop the breaker and shut off. Because when it's in the vehicle and it just shuts off, I don't know what's going on. If it is the brushes or if it's the relay or if it's the breaker itself failing, if something externally is getting warm, uh, that's an easy fix. Even if like the brushes are damaged in some way. But if it's the rotor, if it's the windings, if it's the stator, something like that, we can't repair those things and I know that I need to move on and get a different compressor.
it's driving me crazy that I can't figure out where the smoke's coming from. So I pull this motor apart one last time and almost immediately see a hot spot on the uh, on the windings that I didn't pick up before. So it's pretty clear at this point that I just need to upgrade out of these cheaper compressors that I've been messing around with a lot lately and get something quality. I'm gonna go see my friend Matt at Chaotic 4x4 because they have this kind of stuff on the shelf. And I ended up buying two units that he recommended from Viair. I've never used Viair in the past, but I have heard nothing but great things. And I know that their quality is, is way, way, way up there. So it is slower than the Smitty built, but it doesn't matter how fast it is when it doesn't work. Exactly. <laughs> Which is, it's, well, I am. it's a key part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, quality matters. <laughs> yeah, quality does matter. I didn't wake up today thinking I was gonna buy two $300 compressors, but here we are. What a clear difference in what you're getting for your money when you look at these compressors side by side. There's a ton of plastic parts um, that are even designed to look like cooling fins that clearly don't because they're plastic on the Smitty build that you don't see in the Viair. But anyhow, we need to get all this mounted. I want to move on to the next stage of this process so we can move on further in the video and I can explain all the huge plans that we have for this Land Rover. We are dead in the water on the front of the Rover. So we're gonna talk about the back. The, well, obviously I didn't plan on changing air compressors and that everything is built so tight in there that I had to make some huge modifications uh, to our air box and whatnot. I'm gonna have to, I pulled the battery. Uh, so we're gonna move. I've been wanting to go to a bigger house battery anyway. You guys were right, that is not big enough. It's big enough to run the fridge all night, but if. If you want to do much more than that, it's just not enough battery. So I'm going to put a bigger battery in the back because it's the only place I can fit it. And it worked out because with one of the compressors there, we can't run that secondary battery there anyway. So I'm going to wait for some parts. And once the parts show up, we can finish the front. But right now, I want to talk about the back. The This tire carrier setup has worked amazing. And those of you that watch the series, I got, I got a ton of positive feedback. It took a long time to build. It was like a five-part series but it has held up so well and it looks so good and it's been so functional. I haven't had to tighten a nut or a bolt or anything. It is stout. Now, the unit, this, this uh, organizer, this Overland organizing setup has been great for a number of reasons. It's super quiet because it's like a big speaker box back here. Um, it, it's amazing for camping, but if you wanna do anything besides camping, I mean, I, it's not like I can, change the dimensions around to fit a big suitcase. You know what I mean? And so that is the biggest drawback that we've seen. Another drawback is that this fridge is just way bigger than we needed. I didn't realize, I knew that the 75 was a huge fridge and there's times where it's nice to have, but I've spent so much time living out of that Toyota with like a 35 liter. I think it's liter, right? Anyway. It's a way smaller fridge and it meets all my needs. Even whenever we all camp as a family, it's still big enough for all of our stuff that we need to keep cold. So it would be nice to downsize the fridge and pull all of this MDF out because not only are we gonna shed like 300 pounds of weight, but I wanna open this up in a way that it's a little bit more universal. So I wanna go minimalist on the drawers. We might do two slim drawers on the bottom or something. I wanna build almost everything out of aluminum. And then I ordered this really sweet shelf that I found online from a really shifty European website. I don't know if the thing's real, but if it is, I'm so excited. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna be this aluminum shelf that mounts up here. And it's at like that like molly panel type of thing. So we can like weave, you know, first aid kits and different stuff on the bottom. And what I'd like to do is find a company that maybe makes some molly like inner window panels for the inside of the gold wing windows. Or if you have like some sort of a CNC plasma setup, uh, get a hold of me. I, I would love to figure out a way to like build something like that because I think that having it all aluminum and molly is gonna compartmentalize things in the way that I want. Plus I can weave stuff into it. So speaking of the gold wing windows, the gold wing windows are super cool. Every time I like open it up to get in there at a gas station, people are asking me questions. 
I love them, but this is very much a version 1.0 and I have some huge ideas and plans of ways that we can improve those to make them more weatherproof. Um, I don't like the hinges that I use just aren't super durable. So I carry extra hinges in case I have an issue on the trail and I have had an issue on the trail. Um, so there's just some ways that we can upgrade that. So I wanna try to lighten this up in the back. I wanna try to make it a little bit more open and a little bit more universal. And I think that by using that Molly panel the way that I'm thinking, being able to downsize my fridge and whatnot, and just going a little more minimalist with the organization is gonna make it to where it's just gonna be way easier to use for all the stuff that we like to do. Next, I wanna talk about the roof rack and the fender flares. And those might not seem like they're related, but they're both very important to the looks of the vehicle. So first off, the fender flares, I didn't have any other choices. This is pretty much all I could find. And they uh, they do the job, they open up the wheel wells without it making it look terrible, but they're still really flimsy and I'm not a huge fan. I, I might have found some fiberglass fender flares in, uh, in Iceland and I'm still trying to work on that lead. We'll see if I can upgrade these. As far as the roof rack goes, this roof rack is way too heavy. It's super solid and super stout, but I have got to reduce the weight on the roof of this rig. And this rooftop tent is super heavy too. In a perfect world, I would shed both of them, but I really like having such a quick deployable rooftop tent, and this one is extremely high quality. So for now, the tent's gonna stay, but I might, I'm either gonna build the roof rack out of aluminum, or I'm gonna build some sort of a simpler mounting system for the rooftop tent that doesn't require a roof rack at all. I haven't quite ironed out those details, but my intent is to try to shed a couple hundred pounds of weight off the roof if I can. need to flex it out in order to talk about the rear suspension. Hmm, <laughs> no we do not. We'd be a lot cooler if we did, right? We need to have forklift make an appearance in the video and now you kind of get to see um, what it looks like when it's going over like, I don't know, a 30 to a 36 inch rock. And this is exactly how I run it down the highway. We still have sway bars hooked up. We still have air in the airbags. Rear airbags are at 35 PSI. Um, and we still have decent travel, in my opinion. This thing really rides nice on and off-road. It's really stable for what it is. And the front suspension is great. The steering is great. I would like to, we're at least gonna go to a 39 inch tire, but if I can fit it, and I know I'm gonna get a lot of crap for this, but I would love to do a 42, um, just to be able to air way down in snow and really be able to get into the deep stuff. So, I wanna do hydro assist in the front. If you're a Land Rover guy and you know of a write-up or something that shows exactly how to tap the box and all that, let me know in the comments. I would, I'd love to learn more on exactly how to convert this over to hydro assist. Rear suspension, we're gonna make some changes. We're gonna do trailing arms, and as you can see, we're gonna do coilovers. Um, the reason for that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have great performance out of the rear as it sits, but it's not gonna give us longevity, so. I, this is not how this is designed to be ran from Land Rover, but I, you could either get a rear airbag or a rear coil, and um, I decided to run both because the airbag fits inside. And this was intended to be a temporary setup from the get-go, just so I could see if I liked the airbags and the air system and if it was worth it. It totally is, I love it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull the coil off, we're gonna leave the airbag in this factory location, and then because of the suspension style that we did, it makes it super easy to convert this over to trailing arms. So what that means is that our coilover is gonna actually, instead of mounting to the axle, it's gonna to mount to the lower link. So we're gonna remove both these lower links, we're gonna put trailing arms in their place, and then we're gonna mount a coilover in the front here, <clears throat> which is going to keep the bag from chafing against the coil, because they're gonna be independent, and then if we have a bag failure, we'll still have the coilover 
holding up the brunt of the load of this rig, which is gonna make it, you know, I'm always gonna carry an extra airbag just in case. But if we're in somewhere like Alaska or somewhere really remote and the air system fails in some way, having the peace of mind of knowing we can limp it back to the road because we do have a coilover, I think is like super valuable. This rear axle has developed a problem over the last couple trips that I am puzzled by. It is like seeping oil somewhere on the driver's side axle tube. So is it like a cracked carrier? I haven't seen that before, but I need to figure out exactly what's going on. And if if it is, then this is something that means I'm gonna have to replace the rear axle with a different one. So that is something is definitely on the agenda and something that we're gonna deal with on the series. This intake tube is so embarrassing. <laughs> I used to work with a guy who would say temporarily permanent. That is totally what happened here. I I knew when I put this together, it was gonna be a temporary thing. It just took me forever to, it took me thinking I had a bad motor in order to realize how important it is that I just upgrade it. So I have everything I need to upgrade it except for one small fitting that I ordered off eBay that is not here yet. So we're gonna upgrade this to all silicone and then there's a little fitting that we have to put in the side in order to make the uh, idle air control valve tie into the system. So the, this came disconnected because it's put together super janky. When I, was in, uh, when I was in Canada and I thought the engine was bad because it has so many miles and a slip liner, I thought that it finally was giving up the ghost, but all it was is it was sucking in tons of dirt into the idle air control valve behind the mass airflow sensor and it might have made it run terrible. So long story short, I came home, I realized what had happened, I did a tune up on it, spark plugs, wires, relocated the coil packs and replaced the coil packs. One of the coil packs that was given to me by O'Reilly was bad right out of the box and I didn't realize that until earlier this week whenever I finally had a free moment to reassess what is going on with the Land Rover. All of that to say, it's running, it's driving. As we're doing mods, we're gonna use this thing, which I'm excited about, but this is getting a brand new motor, a brand new five-speed manual transmission, and it's gonna get a brand new transfer case, all from the UK. The motor's actually here. It's got head studs, um, it's got top hat cylinders, so there's no way to slip a liner anymore. It's, it's gonna be a giant upgrade. And for those of you saying, screaming at your TV saying, why aren't you doing an LS swap? I have, I have done tons and tons and tons of research. I'm aware of every single option that is out there and I'm telling you this is the best one. Whenever we do the engine swap, well, the engine replacement, I will explain every single detail as to why it's better to just go with the factory 4.6 versus an LS. So go ahead. Light me up in the comments, I don't mind. I will explain myself and I think that you'll see why I'm saying the things that I'm saying. Um, now I'm ready. I'm gonna go take this out with my son. We're gonna have a ton of fun this weekend. I'm excited to resurrect this project. I hope that you enjoyed the video and I can't wait to start on the rear coilovers next week. Thank you for watching, we'll see you on the trail.